All right, so we're in a series right now on the Ten Commandments. So we want to get in real quick. We're in the third week, and so I don't want to do a ton of review, but I do want to quickly kind of frame the context of how we're looking at, at the Ten Commandments with that question that we've really dug into the first couple weeks, which is what is the purpose of the Ten Commandments? It's very, very important. Because if we don't understand the purpose, we can make a very big mistake. And that would be if we see these Ten Commandments or any of them as kind of the list of rules and do, of do's and don'ts so that you can in some way earn God's love or earn a relationship with Him, we're in trouble. If it becomes that kind of religious burden that you have to live up to to be good enough for God, you're in trouble. That is not at all God's intentions in them. What we have seen in these first few weeks through lots of different places in Deuteronomy that give us the context for why and how God's giving these Ten Commandments, the main thing to see is the Ten Commandments are our response, our relational response to what God has already done. That's huge. So you see the people of Israel who received the Ten Commandments first, and these commandments continue because they carry the, the nature of God, the character of God, and you know, are reaffirmed in the New Testament in a variety of different ways. These commandments were given, very importantly, after God had done some very wonderful things. God had already called the people of Israel. He had done that massive work of salvation, of leading them out, rescuing them out of slavery in Egypt, and began leading them into the promised land. So they had salvation, they had forgiveness, they had promises, they had deliverance, they had provision, they had protection. So they are way deep into a relationship with God. A covenant with God is the Old Testament term. They're way deep into all that, and all that's free. God initiated all that. God decided to do all that. That wasn't because they earned it wasn't because they were good enough. That's called grace. And guess what? It's there in the Old Testament. It's from the very beginning. God initiates. We love because he first loved us. It's the same story. So God shows all this love to the people of Israel, and essentially what he says in the commandments is, love me back. Deuteronomy 6.5 summarizes all of the commandments like this. You shall love the Lord with all, excuse me, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. That comes right after the Ten Commandments because it's a summary of what the Ten Commandments are supposed to be about. And if it rings a bell, it should, because Jesus said this is the greatest commandment. It's a summary of the Law and the Prophets, it's a summary of the whole Old Testament. Our responsibility. God loves, we love Him back. It's called a relationship. And so these commandments must be seen not as a way to create or earn a relationship, but rather they're the response to the loving relationship God has already made possible, already initiated, and they preserve, they protect, and they strengthen and deepen that relationship that's already there. So with that in mind, you see the first commandment, have no other gods before me. That's put God first. That's, that's God's love language. <laughs> Put him first. He loves you. Love him back. How? Put him first. Make him the number one priority in your life in every single aspect of life. Not a little bit here, not a little bit there. Like Jesus said, don't have two masters. It doesn't work. Have one. God on the throne. So let's move now into the third commandment with that in mind. Deuteronomy 5.11. You shall not take the, the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So what does it mean to take the Lord's name in vain? How is that a response of love to God? How is that part of loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength? As Jesus said and God said in Deuteronomy. So we got to ask, what does it mean? What does that mean to take God's name in vain? And really there are kind of multiple branches to this tree. 
One aspect is it's about not using God's name in vain to justify something that isn't God's nature or God's will. And sadly, we can see that throughout human history at times, in the church at times, that in the name of God or in the name of Christ, things were done that absolutely do not reflect the character of Christ, the name of Christ that is being carried. So that would be one way. And in, in particular, in the context of those days, there was, as we talked about last week, there was a lot of little g gods that were used almost like you know, Santa Claus or a vending machine, whereas if you invoked the name of, of your God, then this would happen. Like we said, it was the God of fertility or the God of provision or the God of vengeance or the God of the moon or whatever. And so gods were often just a means, a selfish means to an end. And if you knew the name of a God, then you got, kind of had power to like, almost like a magic spell, a magic declaration. And that's where God comes along and says, first of all, no, I'm the God of it all, but I'm not to be, my name, my name Yahweh that I've given you in covenant relationship is not to be used in vain. It's not to be used like every, like many of those other people are using their God's names as these little kind of magic incantations just to get something. So that was another piece of it. But one really significant aspect of not using God's name in vain that I want to drill down on today is about being authentic in our relationship with God. Loving God back, our response to all the love and grace that he pours into our life, promises, provision, salvation, forgiveness, to love him back, to respond well, is to live in an authentic way, an authentic relationship with him. So really it's about not claiming to be someone you're not. It's about not claiming to be, to have a faith that you don't. You know, it's really easy to do. And, and let's, let's be honest, this is a regular temptation. Absolutely it is in life to, even in the church, to put on a facade, to act like you got it all going on, to slap on a Sunday smile, even if life's falling apart, to pretend everything's okay. At times, you know, you could sing worship songs you don't even really believe. Now, we have a, we have a solution for that. What we like to say is, if, if you are identifying with these lyrics and you're able to bring authentic thanks and praise for what God has done, then do it. That's awesome. And God says, do it with all your might. But if you're not there, don't pretend you are. What do you do? You just turn it into a cry. You turn it into a prayer. Say, God, I want to know you in this way as the lyrics are describing. I want to know you as my deliverer. I want to see you provide. I want to experience that you are so faithful and never let me down. Whatever the lyric is, don't sing it if you don't mean it like that. Turn it into that prayer, that authentic I want to know you in this way. Or we can quote Bible verses that we've never lived. <laughs> you, know? We, we, you know, the Bible's so full of truth, incredible truth, where it puts out these ideals of the incredible abundant life we're made for, but none of us are fully there and will never be in this life, so we don't got to quote the Bible like we are. Or we can make prayer de declarations that we don't really believe. Because of the pressure of, oh, someone else is praying this, and, and man, they, they seem really, wow, fired up about that prayer, and so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be emotional. We can, in the, on the same lines, project a faith level that's much greater than we actually have. Those are ways that are in vain. That's why I, I kind of like to be playful about it. I'm learning and growing in this. You know, when people say, hey, man, how you doing? Everything good? I like to casually say, Nope. I, you know, usually get a weird look. Like, nope. I mean, what do you mean? Like, you're, you're a pastor. Right? That's a weird answer. Aren't you supposed to kind of have it all together? No. And first of all, pastor is way down the list on my identity, by the way. I'm just a child of God. Just a person. Saved by grace. A follower of Jesus. Learning to love him, know him, be transformed by him. Husband, father, basketball player, pastor. Oh, it's... Somewhere down there, I'm just playing. But seriously, I love living in the freedom under his grace that, no, I don't have to be perfect. So when I hear everything good, I just kind of like to be playful a little bit. Like, nope, everything's not good. Life has challenges all the time, always will, this side of heaven. But God is good. So is everything good? No. 
but God is good. And I kind of feel like the point of my life as a follower of Jesus is I'm hoping those things collide. Everything is not good. God is good. And I'm learning and hoping and praying that those, there's mighty collisions there so that more and more is good, is transformed. But that kind of mindset, you know, is just one way it keeps me from being a pretender. Or worse, taking the Lord's name in vain by using religious language to cover up where I'm really at. At the end of the day, I think this command is really good. It's, it's, it's freedom. At first, it kind of, oh, don't take the Lord's name in vain. But the reality that God wants to have an authentic relationship with you and his grace covers where you're at, that's freedom. That's good news. We don't have to pretend Jesus said something along these lines that is one of the most stunning words that I've ever, that I know that he says. Listen to this about taking the Lord's name in vain. Think about it. Jesus said in Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, that's calling him by name, by the way, will enter, or using his name, Enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That is probably the most startling example of the Lord's name in vain that, that I can find in the scripture. I mean, wow, people come to Jesus. That's good. That's a good start. Call Jesus Lord. That's, that's good too. We're, we're going to all affirm all these great things, right? Call him Lord, Lord, double Lord. Awesome. <laughs> Cast out a demon in the name of Jesus. How many of y'all done that? That, that? You know, if I'm doing that, I think I'm having a pretty good day. Prophesy in the name of Jesus, miracles in the name of Jesus, and Jesus says, watch out. You might hear this. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I mean, those things we just mentioned, that's like, that's like the Christian cool kids club. <laughs> like, you do those things, nobody's questioning your relationship with God. And Jesus says, those people might hear, depart from me, workers of lawlessness. Why? I don't even know you. Man, I don't even know what to do with that verse other than hear the bottom line that Jesus is saying is when it's all said and done, what, what it's got to be all about for you is knowing God. That's it's what it's got to be all about. From the beginning to the middle to the end, it's just all about knowing Jesus. In fact, Jesus said it in John 17, 3, eternal life is knowing God and the one whom God has sent, Jesus Christ. So eternal life, that's what, that's what I have all of heaven's about. It starts now is eternal life, getting to know God. It's all about knowing God. And Jesus says, if you miss that, you are taking my name in vain. You are living in vain. So the foundation is simply about knowing him. And God is obviously, as Jesus is expressing, very serious about an authentic relationship with him. I want to take us to the Psalms for a moment where the idea of that authentic relationship is affirmed all over the Psalms. Psalm 13, 1 and 2. The psalmist prayed like this. Let's just check this. Can we pray this in church? Are we comfortable with this level of authenticity? How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts day after day and have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? That is some authentic prayer. That, this dude's not pretending, right? He is not putting on any facades. He's not pretending to be somewhere where he's not. He, he's hurting. I mean, that how long phrase, that does not just happen in that psalm. That happens like 25 times in the psalms. And this is a cry, a deep soul cry 
of, of hurt, of God, where are you? God, I need you. God, I'm suffering over here. Psalm 77 has some similar language. Verses 4 to 9, he says, I'm so troubled that I cannot speak. And then he goes on to speak. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? He's writing a psalm, a prayer to God. God, have you forgotten your grace? I mean, that's, especially New Covenant here, that's kind of an offensive question, <laughs> like, right? This, this person is got the gloves off with God, if you will. They're going through a hard time. They're going through a pit. They're going through a valley. That happens in life. Let's not pretend it doesn't. And, and they, they are incredibly authentic in their prayers. Saying things like, God, will you forget me forever? Are you hiding from me? Is your, has your steadfast love stopped? You see the picture? Steadfast love that keeps going on and on. Has it stopped? Has your promises that you made, have you forgot them? Did you forget that you were a gracious God? Whew, I mean, this, this is as about the, of raw human emotion, frustration, despair, anger, and they're bringing it to God. What you see in these Psalms as they are there in God's word they are, I believe, authentic examples of that real relationship where God wants it all and God can handle it. That God would rather you express frustration and doubt or even anger to him if that's where you're at. He'd rather have that than you pretending or pretending to believe something that you really don't and just putting on a, a fake prayer. That's what those psalms show us. Now, let's be very clear. They don't show us these to say, hey, this is a great place to be. This is God's, end, you know, his God's will for your life. He wants you to stay there. So just start to take that on as your identity and just deal with it and live with it. Absolutely not. What you see in all of those psalms is there's redemption. There's transfer taking place. There's from the pit of despair, like Psalm 40 we talked about on Friday, to God lifting them up out of the pit of despair, setting their feet on a rock and putting a new song in their mouth. But the point is, don't pretend you're on the rock with a song to sing if it's fake and you're not. If you're in the pit of despair, be real with God so that he can actually be your savior, lift you up and give you a genuine song to sing. Psalm 13, 5. Let's see it right here. So this is Psalm 13, the end of it. We saw the beginning where he's just like, oh, you know, just having a rough day in the pit. God, I think you forgot me. You're nowhere. You're busy doing other things. You don't even care. You know, that's my summary. And then he gets to the end and he says, but, Psalm 13, 5. I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. So it's like we don't want to start in, you know, Psalm 13 and glory in it. This is not what we're about as a church. We just go walking around like, I'm so mad at God. He forgot me again. I think his love's fake. He's not gracious. I mean, we're not like, hey, let's be real. You know, it's like, it's not a contest of how much we can like curse God. Not at all. We want to get to the end of the psalm. But we need to know that God can handle when you're genuinely not there. And he does not want you to fake your way there. So you, you got to be, you know, keep that honoring of God on your lips. But be real. And then you get to the end and you say, but... <laughs> I know God's love. I know what he's done. I will sing. I will sing again. 
And that is right there. That's authentic relationship so that we're not taking his name in vain. This is, this is so beautiful. When, when, when God made this real to me 15 years ago or so through a very bad time of life, a very hard physical struggle in my, with my wife, with my, my, our, my, our second child, who you know the doctors had said there was a time when they didn't know if either one of them was going to make it to the pregnancy. I don't even want to get into all that story today. But I, this was, I, I felt these Psalms like I had never felt before. And in the midst of it, what I felt from God was approval for being real. And out of it, I, I, my whole relationship with God has changed because I was in seminary at the time. I felt that pressure of, you know, you got to be, you know, you're, you're training for the ministry. It's kind of like you have it. You got, you got a lot going on. You, you kind of got it all together. You got to be the example. And, and it, you know, when you hit that certain pit, you, it comes a time where it's like, well, you're either going to be real or you're going to lose it, right? Because the deep needs and cries of your heart are not lining up with the pain of life. And so as I, for the first time, without even kind of examples of how to do it, found the Psalms and, whoa, these guys are honest, frustrated, doubting, and God can handle it. Again, you don't glory in the pit. You don't want to stay there, but you, you can be real. God can handle it. And it just, I felt God's approval in it. It was weird. It was very foreign to me. Again, not to glory in it. And you don't want to stay there, but when you're there, be real. God can handle it. And what it did for me was unlock, and I would say take down a stronghold of having to perform, of a little facade, having it all together, everything good. Oh, yeah, yeah, everything good, everything good right now. No. God wants you authentic. We even see that in the Apostle Paul. 2 Corinthians 1, and we'll close with this verse. Verse 8. Paul says, We do not want you all to be unaware, brothers and sisters, of the affliction that we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt, that's a key word, we felt, the psalmists are feeling, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. How does the same guy who says, give thanks always, rejoice always, and again I say rejoice, hope always, that we have joy unspeakable in God. How is that same guy say we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength we despaired of life itself translation we were ready to die right before that in first corinthians paul kind of gives the answer so he kind of flips the psalms he starts with where he ended up and then shared the pit kind of reverse order Check out 1 Corinthians 1, 3, just right before that. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So that's his testimony, and he starts with it. That's the end of the story for him. He says, blessed be the God of all comfort who comforted us in our affliction so now we can genuinely comfort you with God's comfort if any of you are afflicted. We can pass on that good news of the power and the presence and the personal reality of God through Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. We're confident that we can help comfort you if you're afflicted because that's what God did for us. And here is the specifics. We wanted to die. We were in such a pit. But... God comforted us. That's who God is. He lifted us up out of the pit, set our feet on a rock, gave us a song to sing, and we want to pass that on to you if you need it. It's all the same story. Paul knows that what the ideals and goals are, 
You know, he knows those ideals are to give thanks in everything, to rejoice again, always, and again I say rejoice, to walk in that joy unspeakable, to have that hope that overflows. He knows those are all the realities of God is good, the abundant life is here and coming, but when he is struggling, he's not afraid to express it to God in order to see God deliver him and comfort him. That's authentic. That's the authentic life with God. It's the same one the psalmists live. It's the same one that Deuteronomy chapter 5 is calling us to in that command. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. That's a call to freedom, to be authentic right where you're at. And let that be your, your journey with God. Let's pray. Let's take a quiet moment. If you're new with us, we do this somewhat often just because it's so hard to get quiet in our world. And just wonderfully beautiful things happen in, in those quiet moments where we make ourselves available to God and ask the Holy Spirit to speak and seal things in our hearts. So we want to just take a quiet minute just between you and God and respond to God right now with what you are hearing from God's word, ask the Holy Spirit to bring clarity. Kind of what's that big thing he's wanting to say to you? We believe that. He loves to speak. We talked about that Friday night. He wants his children to hear his voice. So he wants, we are confident his Holy Spirit desires to make clear to you something this morning. Good news, an invitation, a challenge, anything God reveals, it's because he wants to heal. It's never to condemn he wants to draw you closer to him in that authentic relationship. So let's just sit and listen. What is it that he's wanting to say to you today? Is there an area of life where he wants you to get real with God? Is there potentially a facade? He's just giving you the freedom to say, let down, let it down. Take that wall down. Let others see your authentic self. Let God see it. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would do what you love to do. Speak to your children draw us into greater level of that authentic relationship with you.